Taylor Riggs in San Francisco and for Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, the threat you can't see. President Trump speaks after Iran's missile strikes. Even if military attacks wane, cyber risks remain. We'll discuss what might come next. Plus, speaking of security risks, the video sharing service TikTok poses big ones. According to a network security provider, Checkpoint will speak to the CEO. And Quibi's big plans. We hear from tech and media veterans Meg Whitman and Jeffrey Katzenberg from CES in Las Vegas on Quibi's big offerings. But first, our top story, and that is the threat of war, often brings increased profits for the defense industry. And the risk of a new wave now of cyber attacks from Iran could shine a spotlight on the companies that protect digital assets. Just take a look at how two of those firms, FireEye and CrowdStrike, have performed. Their shares have gained about 8% in the last few days. And it's all indicative that cyber volleys between the U.S. and Iran are not going away anytime soon. To discuss what could be next in the New York. It is Marcus Fellier. He is the director of strategic threat at AI security firm Darktrace. And in studio, it is our cybersecurity reporter, Kardike Mirotra. Kardike, let me start with you. We got the attacks of from Iran in physical form. Does that mean that we're all clear from the cyber perspective? Definitely not. Uh, I think there's a significant distinction between Iran's conventional battlefield capabilities and where they are on the cyber front. They're never going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the United States, or at least um, in this realm, uh, on a, in a conventional battle. In the cyber realm, they have a greater chance of pushing back uh, more dramatically and having greater impact in the United States. So even though they haven't gone that route uh, in terms of immediate reprisal, it's certainly not out of the question that in the days, months, uh, weeks to come, we'll see something else from Iran. And Marcus, your take on this, moving now from a physical attack to still waiting on a potential cyber attack. Sure. Thank you, Taylor. Yeah, I think, Kartike, you make great points that them moving into the cyberspace, this is, this is the time for them to do it even more than they already have, which they have historically up to this point of the most recent attacks and then beyond. So certainly I wasn't expecting to see it as the immediate retribution. I think we saw that last night in the initial term, but those cyber attacks and the vulnerabilities that the U.S. had are significant. And when we think about those vulnerabilities, it expands not only the government, but the large amount of threat landscape associated with the private industry and commercial companies. And Marcus, I wonder why a physical attack first and then a cyber attack? Why is cyber attack seen as a secondary choice? So I would have said a secondary or augmenting or kind of happening together. I really mm -hmm. feel like in order to uh, get revenge, the adequate revenge, it needed to be something in the physical space that they could point to, that the Iranians could point to as on par to, you know, what occurred. However, you know, cyber, unless they were going to go after critical infrastructure as their, their first move, which I think would have been very bold and very escalatory, uh, cyber moving forward beyond the physical allows them to still do it behind the scenes that both would include something they could attribute, say that they did conduct, or allow it to be conducted, you know, absent their actually putting their name to it. Cardike, in the introduction, we were talking about FireEye and CrowdStrike released just a few examples of some of the companies that could benefit from this. In your reporting, is it too early to tell some of the early winners and losers? Yeah, it's really hard to say because uh, you have CrowdStrike and FireEye as the two prominent strictly cyber firms that are listed, but there are dozens of large and small companies that play in this space. Microsoft offers uh, cybersecurity solutions and on-site uh, services when there's a hack. Uh, Cisco does as well. There are local providers in states that are providing um, state governments and counties with cybersecurity um, protection. So um, I think you can distinctly state that CrowdStrike and FireEye will reap some of, some of the benefits, but uh, what share of it is, is kind of hard to tell right now. Marcus, I'm curious to know now that we've been talking about this for a few days, if that means that we are any more prepared? Well, so I, I don't think the answer is yes. I think you have, we're much more on guard. Uh, I don't think pre prepared, either we're prepared before or we're trying to prepare now. 
Uh, and as you talk about the cybersecurity companies and what they're looking at and what they may be thinking about in terms of being positioning, I think one area we're seeing a, a growth in this industry and more focus is the uh, application of artificial intelligence to move faster into that security space more quickly. So maybe you can get more prepared faster, right? Because we have a scarcity of cybersecurity uh, skill sets. You know, the, there's a there's a number of individuals that are trying to you know figure out the right formula for both bringing in new technologies like artificial intelligence while getting a robust, more robust security team uh, in place. Marcus, some of your smart analysis has pointed to an increase in national infrastructure and cyber physical attacks. Walk me through both of those. Sure. I mean, I think uh, the place that we're most, that we, there's a lot of vulnerability in the U.S. And in fact, if they were going to strike inside the U.S., I didn't think it would be physical. I thought it might be against critical infrastructure. I think maybe today we've moved past that that level of escalation, but it remains a vulnerability uh, in, in something that we have to be very mindful of. And I know that the, the U.S. government is obviously very focused on it, but you have these systems, right, these critical infrastructure in which you have these operational, these more legacy historical systems now being more linked into with the IT, and that makes that more that vulnerability increase. I think on the cyber physical front, you're talking about moving away from going after data, grabbing data, and more at causing machines to destroy themselves through a cyber attack, which mm. is significant if we move further into that space and becomes mainstream as uh, a viable uh, escalation point. And Cardike, I feel like I come to you every few days or so and ask how good are the Iranian coders and how much better are we at, at defending ourselves? How far do we know how um, far, I guess in preparation, I'm trying to see, do we know that they are getting ahead of us? It's hard to say on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. how they're progressing, but uh, since uh, Stuxnet hit more than 10 years ago, we've seen Iran's cyber capabilities mature progressively. In 2012, uh, their Shimun attack on Saudi Aramco was seen as their introduction to the global landscape, and nobody thought they would use that tech again, but then four years later, they were able to tweak it and attack um, a broader swath of Saudi assets uh, once again. We've seen smaller attacks, but that are more uh, incrementally sophisticated in their technology and the ways that they're using it to indicate that their program is getting stronger. The trouble is that understanding exactly what they're capable of only really occurs when they successfully infiltrate um, an adversary. And so uh, I guess we'll really know what they're capable of when we see what they're capable of. And Marcus, finally here for size and scope, do you have an estimate of the economic damage that this could cause on any one corporation or in total as you look? I think it's very hard to tell. Uh, you know, I think we're saying the average breach is costing a company maybe $4 million. I think that's on the small scale and not certainly the nation state level attack. Uh, you know, looking across the vulnerabilities, across the financial uh, companies, as well as non-traditional companies, I don't think they're going to stick to traditional areas. They're looking closely at where is the vulnerability as much as where is the greatest impact. So the way that they progress, as Carter K mentioned, their sophistication also allows them to scale to maybe some of the smaller areas, maybe not specifically just the big ones that immediately come to mind is where you would expect them to operate. I think they're looking at all options and all across all the different industries uh, within the United States in terms of areas to either make access that they either can act on today or act on tomorrow. Marcus Fowler of Dark Trace and Bloomberg's Carter K. Merotra, thank you both for joining. And coming up, our conversation with Quibi, CEO Meg Whitman and founder Jeffrey Katzenberg on their new venture in that crowded streaming space. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. With all eyes this week on the CES trade show in Las Vegas, famous for an array of personal gadgets, it's worth considering something counterintuitive. Venture capitalists like consumer technology a lot less than before. Just last year, enterprise tech startups raised more cash than consumer tech companies for the first time in at least five years. To discuss, we're joined by Bloomberg Technology's Sarah McBride, who wrote about this in today's fully charged newsletter, What's Driving the Change? Well, a lot of things. For a start, the um, tech companies 
have a much shorter path to IPO and profitability. I spoke to one tech executive who told me that he thinks you can get to 100 million in revenue much faster as an enterprise company than you can as consumer. Enterprise used to be super boring, just SaaS accounting software. Now it's kind of cool. Uh, Stuart Butterfield from Slack has helped drive that. And also consumers lost a little bit of luster these days. What does that say about consumer tech? Because if you were an investor, originally thought maybe you, not, you could IPO, maybe a big company could come and buy you out. Wow, what does that mean now for the future of consumer tech, given there's less amount being funded for some of these uh, little startups? Yeah, well, the smartest young entrepreneurs tell me they're just not that interested in consumer tech mm. anymore. And the problem is that a big company, probably Facebook or Google or Apple, will come along and buy you before you've even had the chance to get going. And if you say no, they say fine, we'll crush you. And then they go ahead and try to develop whatever you were doing in-house. And then you're just, it's a no-win situation either way. And enterprise companies can't really do that. If they try to replicate what you were doing in-house, it's probably not going to work out very well. And through your reporting, have you still seen IPOs being favored versus being bought out by a big company? If you think consumer tech, you're like, okay, well, Google or Apple will come buy me out. Right. Yeah, that's right. And they, they might. And so the outcome will be smaller if you're a bot. If you make it to the IPO stage as a consumer company, it's probably a blockbuster giant IPO. So that's not necessarily the same for some of these enterprise tech companies. It'll be a smaller IPO, but you have a much higher chance of getting there. You know, Sarah, I think a lot of the concerns in this business and private capital, there's so much cash chasing too few good investments. Does that continue to be the theme or are we starting to see some diversification really between cash deciding, you know what, that doesn't look good, I'm going to stay away? Right. So um, for enterprise, the creativity is astonishing. People keep coming up with these very clever ideas for how to make businesses better. So while a lot of the companies sound similar to each other, there's actually incredible innovation and a market for the product among bigger companies that'll pay money for it. So as long as that keeps happening, I don't think it's a question of too much cash chasing too few companies, unlike in consumer, where we certainly see that. Well, we'll have to see, of course, if that trend continues in 2020. That is Bloomberg Technology, Sarah McBride. Thank you for joining us. Now back to CES. Earlier, we caught up with Quibi CEO Meg Whitman and founder Jeffrey Katzenberg from the Las Vegas event. We talked about how mobile content can shape the future of streaming. Take a listen. What we talked about today was a new technology platform, which is part of our differentiation versus the other streaming services, that will allow mobile viewing to be extraordinary and enable creators to tell stories in a whole new way for the mobile phone. And just a couple of other things. We think that people will be on Quibi during the day, 7 in the morning till 7 at night, on the go viewing, where they have a chance to watch very fantastic Hollywood quality content, but in those short bites. And we've, we, as I said, we introduced a technology today that, that is full screen video, landscape to portrait, that allows you to see content in ways you've never seen before. And of course, you've just closed a second round of funding as well, $400 million that'll carry you through the spring launch in April and beyond. Um, Jeffrey, I want to get more on the details here because 175 new original shows, 8,600 episodes of quick bite content. As Romain said, this is a crowded field. Who exactly are you targeting here with this content and how do you convince them to pay another $4.99 on top of their Netflix subscription, their HBO Go and their Disney Plus? Our content is uh, quite unique, very differentiated from anything that anybody is making today. As Meg said, um, we're relying on this incredible new technology. It is really quite revolutionary in terms of the quality of what we can uh, deliver. And then, you know, yes, there's a tremendous volume of content because people want quality, but they also want quantity. We will publish 
three hours of original content every single day on Quibi. That's 35% more than a broadcast network uh, shows in prime time. We're not competing for the television set. All of the things that are going on today around OTT and streaming are all focused on what people are doing in front of their TV. Less than 10% of the viewing of Netflix, HBO, Disney Plus, any of them are actually on a telephone. And we are only on a telephone, and so we are highly differentiated, and our use case is quite different. Now, are we competing for the same dollars? The answer is yes, we are, but we think we're offering people something that's new, exciting, um, and, and unlike anything that they've seen before, and our, our bet is is that um, you know it will be highly appealing and, as I said, unique. Can you talk a little bit, though, about uh, the cost, I guess, to sort of uh, get up to speed, or I guess uh, just to get that content out there? Obviously, we mentioned the fundraising uh, that you've had so far. Well, here's something I would point out. So we would be the first streaming service that will launch without a library, because you can't just take an hour-long television show and chop it up into six, 10-minute segments. Everything is created created new for Quibi because the platform is new and, and the viewing experience is completely different. And we think with 175 shows, 8,600 episodes, as you mentioned earlier, it's a unique content strategy and there's a lot of content. And so we think our, you know, we've, um, as you know, had a fundraise before this one, and th this fundraise will carry us right through the middle of 2021. So we're well funded, and uh, you know, we'll we'll see how we how we start off. But we feel great about the amount of content that we're creating for this device in this quick bite, on the go viewing kind of format. That was Quibi CEO Meg Whitman and founder Jeffrey Katzenberg. And coming up, a bump for Bitcoin. The cryptocurrency reaches the highest price since November. Why rising tensions between the U.S. and Iran may be the reason we discuss next. This is Bloomberg. I am David Weston. Bloomberg Television is reinventing one of the most iconic brands in financial television for a new audience. Join me to see the news program for the clever investor. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. Bitcoin has climbed to the highest level since November after breaching the $8,000 price threshold. Concerns about an escalation in the conflict between the U.S. and Iran are seen as contributing to the rally in Bitcoin, which is not managed by a government. To discuss, we are joined by BitPay Chief Commercial Officer Sunny Singh. Thanks so much for joining us. First, I want to come and take a look at a chart here that I'm showing inside my terminal. It's a technical chart, but I think the theme really is we've been in this trading range. We're not overbought at these levels, but that key 8,000 level means we could be breaking out of this trading range. Do you see the price increase recently as technically driven? Yeah, so great question, actually. I'm obviously not a technical trader, but again, the technical and high frequency trading is really what drives this market in Bitcoin. And anytime you have an unforeseen circumstance, like the Iran incident that happened a couple of days ago, that adds some new buyers to the market, they weren't expecting that, and that bumps it up. And that little bump actually in buying pressure really drives it to be up next thing you know, 20% in two days. So I am shocked to hear that it's moving higher with gold and seen as a safe haven. How is that possible? Yeah, so every couple of years we have these events. I remember about four years ago, the Greece incident. Bitcoin became a safe haven for that, actually. So we see that happen a lot. Now, I don't think people actually went and sold their GE stock and all that and bought Bitcoin. But I see what happens is just a little bit of people start buying Bitcoin, and that, with the technical trading, really bumps it up and makes it go a higher a lot faster. What are some of the fundamentals behind Bitcoin going higher in 2020? Yeah, so, you know, it's funny. A year ago, I was on the show exactly the same time, and I predicted when Bitcoin was only 3500 that it would hit close to $15,000, and it actually did pretty much. And this year, you know, I'm going to make a prediction. I think Bitcoin passes the all-time high and goes past 20000 this year. How? Why? Yeah. What's driving that? And a lot of people think it's going to be because of the halving, and that happens in May where the supply of Bitcoin will drop in half. But I think that's already factored in a lot. Bitcoin, again, goes up high when the unforeseen things happen. So last year, the catalyst behind that was Libra happening with Facebook. Mm -hmm. No one saw that coming, and that really made it go up fast. This year, again, things like China, Russia, or India could legalize Bitcoin. Some new companies competitive to Facebook can get involved. The American government could do something. Something unforeseen that could happen will really move it faster. 
But fundamentally, we've already seen Fidelity launch their product. Square's hired five engineers already in the Bitcoin trade, Bitcoin side, actually. So all these large tech companies are already getting in the space, actually. So I think you'll start seeing those type of products coming to market, too. But it's going to be the unforeseen thing, I think, which happens every year, which will really make it go up fast and far. I want to break down some of those different themes that you were talking about, the first of which was Libra. Perhaps seen as a competitor, but does it give, I guess, legitimacy to the space? Absolutely. I think what Libra is all about, a payment option, too, for digital mm-hmm. currency, which is really what Bitcoin's been trying to do. And Libra actually can make it go fast because it's already got brand awareness around the world with 2 billion users in the Facebook platform. So once Libra, if it does get approved by the governments, actually, you'll see people start adapting cryptocurrency, digital currency, the Libra currency. And then once they're in it, they can there go from Libra to Bitcoin or whatever it may be. But it adds a lot of new people to the environment, the user base that was never previously installed with Bitcoin but before. does that regulatory scrutiny that Libra and Facebook brought help or hurt? It's actually helped because you've got governments now saying to Libra, why can't you be more like Bitcoin? <laughs> which is really funny, which happened last year. Um, it's, it's getting a lot of attention now. And the governments have now realized we need to regulate this in some way, actually, where they weren't sure about before. And now China's thinking about launching their own digital coin, too, competitive to Libra. So if China does something, what's the American government going to do? Do you see China and Russia as real legitimate, um, I I guess, uh, competitors to taking on the U.S., to taking on a cryptocurrency here, to taking on a Bitcoin? Do you see that as a real issue in 2020? Uh, Absolutely. I'm not sure about Russia as much. Uh, China has already announced they have plans for a digital currency. And they really control a lot of the crypto markets themselves. So I think the American government and I offer myself to go meet with Trump and his team in the White House to really sit down and explain to them what the value of cryptocurrency could be and what the role of the U.S. government should be, actually, because the last thing you want is a foreign company government to take control of this market. I think one of the worries about Bitcoin in the crypto space is the volatility. When do you expect to see some of the reduced volatility and some of the drop in the wild swings that we get? Yeah, I think that'll happen over time as more and more platforms like backed and options and futures get involved, actually, and more institutional buying comes in, actually, larger buyers. But in the meantime, it's driven by technical traders, as you see, any little news can bump it high or drop it down pretty fast. But that'll eventually change. I think, listen, three, four years ago, instead of a 20% bump in the last two days, it would have been 40%. So finally, you're saying 20,000 on Bitcoin. When? Uh, sometime this year, we'll pass 20,000. I'm not sure we'll end where that ends at, but uh, sometime this year, we'll beat 20,000. We'll have you on then. Thanks to Sunny Singh, Chief Commercial Officer at BitPay. And coming up, major security flaws in that beloved video app TikTok have been revealed. We'll talk to the company who discovered them. That's next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology Global Link, where we join Bloomberg Daybreak Australia to bring you the latest in global tech news. I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco with Kathleen Hayes in New York and Heidi Stroud-Watts in Sydney. Let's take a look at those top global tech stories of the day. Kathleen? Well, let's start with the UK. A warning from a regulator has Facebook and eBay cracking down on fake reviewers. Facebook took action against 188 groups, while eBay targeted 144 users. The action came after the Competition and Markets Authority demanded changes for fake and misleading online reviews from being bought and sold. Moving on to London-based foreign exchange company Travelex saying it's finally contained the ransomware attack that crippled it since New Year's Eve. The cyber attack forced the firm to suspend suspend services across 30 countries. According to the BBC, the hackers claiming responsibility demanded $4.6 million. 58 Home, one of China's leaders in connecting people online with services from flower delivery to home cleaning, is seeking a U.S. IPO of nearly $2 billion. The company is owned by 58.com. They're the China's equivalent to Craigslist. It's also backed by Tencent. 
Its last private funding round in 2015 came in at $300 million. Those are the top global tech stories we're watching. Taylor, back to you. Well, the U.S. government says TikTok is a national security risk, focusing on how the popular viral video app could let the Chinese government access people's data. And cybersecurity firm Checkpoint found major security flaws that would have given hackers plenty of ways to get TikTok users' information. We should note that TikTok says it has patched the flaws since being notified by Checkpoint. So for more, we're joined by Checkpoint's head of engineering, Jeff Schwartz. Jeff, your report was uh, alarming. Pretty much page after page, I was getting more and more nervous. What were some of the major security flaws that you found? Yeah, so our research found uh, a number of very concerning issues. Um, the first two, and they layered on top of each other. So the first two of which uh, allowed a bad actor or malicious uh, user to uh, modify URLs uh, for login that would result in code being run on the victim's uh, device. Based on that code being run, um, a um, account takeover activity was, uh, was, is capable to be leveraged against the victim device. And once that account is taken over, uh, there was modification of uh, videos, uh, a uh, adding videos, deleting videos, marking videos that are uh, uh, private as public. Um, and then there was a, a subsequent uh, vulnerability that we discovered that allows for uh, API access into uh, the personal data of the account owner um, that, is, uh, being that was being maintained by TikTok. Jeff, what are the weaknesses in the infrastructure that allow this to happen? And I understand when you informed uh, TikTok about this, they deployed a, a solution or a patch for it. Yeah, we notified them through uh, responsible disclosure and they were quite responsive and, and cooperative in, in, in closing these issues. But the research is emblematic of a, of a much larger concern and, and that is the fact that, um, that many, many applications are deployed on uh, both consumer and enterprise devices uh, that are, are susceptible. And these are the uh, discovered vulnerabilities that we know of. And when we, when we consider what we don't know and, and the applications that have not gone through the level of extensive research that we've done like last year with WhatsApp and this year with uh, TikTok, and we, we, we consider the surface area of exposure that exists with the volume of applications and the number of devices, um, both consumers and enterprises um, have, have not sufficiently taken qualitative preventative controls into account in securing their devices and information. You mentioned some of the other tech companies that you've looked at WhatsApp, you know, mm -hmm. a few years ago, TikTok this year. Within the vulnerabilities that you found in TikTok, is this unusual or is this to be expected in every sort of high growth tech app that really just wants eyeballs and downloads and gets it out as fast as they can? So it could be a combination of things and it's uh, difficult to say whether this is just a, a byproduct of, of human error uh, in, in, de in development cycles or uh, there was malicious intent. And uh, ByteDance as the owner, you know, perhaps uh, would be more appropriate to comment on something like that. But um, I, I think it is uh, indicative of larger issues that um, applications have exposures, the operating systems that those applications live on have exposures, and then the hardware itself has exposures. And when we consider this in aggregate, um, there are many, many things that we don't know, and uh, the best course of action is to have uh, preventative controls that can mitigate these things in real time, because uh, as an individual, or even as an individual enterprise, uh, you're not going to be able to monitor these things in a, uh, in a proactive way. Yeah, Jeff, it sounds like a really sprawling problem the way that you put it. But if, as Taylor, I think alluded to, the problem is that these companies are focused on fast growth and adding, you know, shiny new features for users, is there a best practices kind of guideline that they should go with? Yeah, so uh, in, in terms of the organizations that are writing the applications, or are you asking about the uh, individuals using them? Let's go with the organizations yeah. that are creating so, them. The organizations that are creating them, it's, uh, th there are secure development si life cycles that they can yeah. leverage. Um, I, I think the challenge that uh, exists is that uh, they are, there is a race to the market and there is a competitive 
uh, differentiation that they're trying to provide to their end users and to their customers. And uh, that, that push for competitive advantage uh, sometimes leaves these things susceptible to uh, significant compromise. I'm, I'm curious now that TikTok has said that they fixed a lot of the vulnerabilities or all of the vulnerabilities that you pointed out. Do you go back and check for more? Like you said, there were a lot of still undiscovered, unknown, perhaps potential vulnerabilities. Yeah, so we continue through our research. We can, this is a continuing exercise. Mm -hmm. This is not a, there is no finish line in this game. Um, we continue to run and we, we try and prioritize um, the applications and infrastructure technologies that are most widely deployed, um, you know, like, uh, you know, finding um, um, malware in Google Play Store and, and identifying other um, third party repositories that maybe are not going through the same scrutinous uh, research mm. to uh, identify um, um, malicious behavior. Yeah, there's been lots of, uh, you know, negative headlines or, or troubling headlines, if we will, this being the latest with TikTok, but also to do with, uh, you know, the ability to spread false information or false accounts or their data privacy um, policies as well. Is there a sense that regulation isn't really keeping up with the growth in technology? So there's a, a couple concerns. One, um, the, the growth of, of usage of data that uh, consumers and enterprises offer up, the information available in LinkedIn and Facebook and um, through other social media applications. The information is creating a huge surface area of exposure. Um, and given uh, the geopolitical climate these days, um, the weaponization of that of the combination of vulnerabilities and the exposure of data uh, is, is, in, is creating an environment that's where these things are going to be increasingly likely. Jeff Schwartz of Checkpoint, thank you for joining us. And there's much more ahead, so stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Back to our coverage of CES in Las Vegas. This year, there is a big focus on technology and the data behind self-driving cars. Intel's Mobileye unit was the latest to break new ground. The company released footage of a completely autonomous ride around Jerusalem, Israel, with the car relying only on camera technology. Mobileye CEO Amnon Shashua spoke exclusively to Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow about what's setting the company apart in the race to fully autonomous vehicles. We have a vehicle with 12 cameras, four parking cameras and eight long range uh, cameras, uh, feeding information to a single IQ5 chip, which is our latest uh, system on chip. And this car has the ability to drive autonomously end to end. There's no other sensors in the car. Then we have another separate car, which has no cameras, just LADARs and, and radars, performing the same kind of uh, performance. And then at the end of the development, we'll put them to, together to create redundant uh, systems. And what we showed in this clip, that just with the cameras, we can handle driving scenarios that are challenging even for a human driver. When we talk about ADAS, we're talking, of course, about advanced driver assistance systems. In other words, the technology that is behind self-driving. What is it that, that you are doing that is different to your competitors, your direct competitors, but also different to other names out there like Waymo, like Cruise? So I think that there are three areas that separates us from, from, from the crowd. The first one is about a model of safety. We published a paper two years ago about how to formalize the common sense of uh, human driving, how to define what dangerous situation is in the context of decision making on, on merging into uh, traffic. And since then, we have been working with regulatory bodies to standardize uh, this model. Uh, we are the only company that is really transparent about its safety, safety uh, model. That's one element. The second element is about data. We have a crowdsourced technology using vehicles that have ADAS systems on them. We're talking about millions of vehicles. Those vehicles, they send us data. The data goes into the cloud and we build high definition maps automatically. And then we have other business opportunities using this data, not only for autonomous driving. And the third, and I think most important distinguishing element is that we're not leader centric. We, uh, we, we have this concept of two separate uh, streams, one just cameras and the other one lidars and radars, such that these systems are, uh, are redundant. Where, whereas our competitors, they start with a 360 lidar, that's a kind of the common uh, school of thoughts, and then they complement it with additional sensors like, uh, like cameras. The advantage of being able to do, to be camera centric, to have a stream only with cameras, because then it applies also for driving assist, for ADAS. 
it creates a uh, better and robust uh, system by having uh, redundant uh, systems. And uh, we can get the performance, which is much better than just a leader-centric uh, system. Along with some partners, you are working towards a fleet of robo-taxis, for want of a better expression. What's the timeline on that? We have a number of joint ventures. Um, the one that we made public a few months ago was joint venture with Volkswagen uh, to uh, commercially deploy uh, robo-taxi in Tel Aviv to early 2022. There will be about 200 uh, robo-taxi uh, vehicles means without a safety driver, completely aut autonomous, and we are working diligently on meeting that uh, timeline. So early 2022, in parallel, we'll be launching in China, together with uh, NEO. In parallel, we'll be launching in Paris with RATP. In parallel, we'll be launching uh, the city of Diego in uh, South uh, Korea, also a mobility as a service. That was Mobileye CEO Amnon Shashua speaking exclusively with Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. And it's not just tech companies at CES. Media companies are out in force, too. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow caught up with Verizon Media CEO Guru Gaurapin. They discussed how Verizon Media has tapped into the success of Disney Plus and in October announced it would offer customers a year of Disney Plus for free. Gaurapin also outlined how Verizon's own media business will benefit. If you think about our business on the Verizon Media, if you start thinking of us, again, think about the 900 million users globally, we're also the eyeballs on the top of the funnel for Disney+. Plus. So for our side of the business, there's a lot of ad spend that Disney's doing to attract new customers through our ecosystem, that's one. Two, part of our media platform, the streaming service, actually Disney+, Plus leverages that to stream their content today. Uh, so those two businesses actually fuel, as Disney+, Plus grows, as Verizon overall grows, we actually grow with that. Who else could you go? Into partnership Look, with I think in a similar way. The, the reality is there are only limited set number of use cases that you can go. I mean, you, you want to be careful with consumers and you want to work with great iconic brands. Disney is a great brand like Verizon. And that partnership works well. So I think we'll go use case by use case and see who there are. I don't want to name names, but I think there's going to be a limited set of partners who will benefit from this ecosystem. Apple Music did that in a version before with Verizon and Disney is the next big thing that's happening. And I would see that continue as use cases grow. And how do you read Disney's success? I mean, what do you see Disney Plus as achieving in the next 12 months, the next three years? I think at the top level, getting more customers signing up. Two is retention of customers really coming in. And are you keeping them for longer term? Your boss, Hans Vestberg, is, is very focused, laser focused on 5G. The yeah. company more broadly is focused on 5G. What opportunity does 5G bring Verizon Media? One of the biggest use cases when you think about 5G is the media use case is what leverages. Actually, that's the most tangible for consumers and advertisers. We've seen AR in the previous world, in the 4G world, or call it today's world, is very non-mainstream. I think in the 5G world, AR becomes mainstream. Uh, think about XR platform. We launched an XR news platform in collaboration with AP, uh, now this Reuters, which is really building a platform where news becomes experiential. The reason you can't do that at scale today because you don't have the bandwidth, the latency, uh, the speed that you need to be able to do that. 5G at scale helps us do that. So I think for our business, the AR, let that be on the content experience side or on the advertiser side. The AR ad units now become go from 0.001% of the total impression base to a much bigger scale. Sports is another use case. We've been working with NFL, NBA to really get to where fan base and fandom in terms of interactivity goes to the next level. Let's jump in there. I want to talk about sports. Sure. Yahoo Sports is popular. You also have sports book. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about those two businesses, yeah. what they look like in 2020, what the future opportunities are, what sure. revenue looks like, sure. you know, because that's sure. an exciting area. Commerce is where, we, where sports fits into in terms of completing the life cycle, completing the transaction cycle. So we, if you think about in sports, sports betting world. The hardest part is to get the consumers, which is the top of the funnel. What Yahoo has today, our ecosystem, as I said, we are total 900 million base globally, and within the US, sports today is 60 million monthly active user base, right? We are leading player. And you think about our NPS across our product, our fantasy sports. So we already have a tied in consumer base who are, who want to do this, right? So for us, it was a natural extension to close the loop in terms of sports betting. So we were clear that we want to do it. We chose the best partner who can be our underlying platform, that's MGM. And that launched in New Jersey, that's our first legalized betting state. We expect that to grow. And what think, comes next? Uh, look, there are at least five states. I mean, you know, 
know, there are many states that are legalized, but then the policies are not set yet and the product platforms are not set yet. So uh, our hope is in, in this year, at least we have five plus more states. That was Verizon Media CEO Guru Gaurapan speaking with Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Now, Grubhub reportedly is considering strategic options, including a sale. According to Dow Jones, the Chicago-based food delivery service is also looking at an acquisition. Grubhub's also figuring out what to do if an activist investor appears. In the last year, the company's market value has fallen more than $13 billion to roughly $4.5 billion. And still ahead, he's talked to some of the biggest media and tech moguls of today. We'll tap into MediaLink founder and CEO Michael Casson's expertise for the latest trends in streaming, ads, and brands. He's at CES in Las Vegas. This is Bloomberg. Peloton shares are on track to wipe out a strong start to the year. They fell as much as 5% on Wednesday. That is delivering a small win to investors betting against the company and its $2,000 exercise bikes. Peloton's earnings over the holiday period are expected to come sometime next month. Now back to CES in Las Vegas. My next guest has gone on record saying that last year's big story was 5G. This year's big story will be 5G. MediaLink founder, chairman, and CEO Michael Kassan joins me now. Michael, great to have you. How is 5G still the story? I feel like we've been waiting and waiting for it and really uh, yet to see some uh, real fruition come to the table. Well, I, I think it's an evolving story, uh, but it continues to be an important one. Um, you know, as we said last year, and I think it's going to come to, to fruition sooner than we think, the combination of 5G and just about everything that it impacts will have a major consequence, and usually that's going to be positive from everything I know. Uh, the one area that I was so interested in uh, 5G having impact on is content consumption. And uh, I was listening to uh, the news the other day here from CES talking about that other story that continues to be important, which is autonomous driving. And we do believe that autonomous driving and 5G will be part of continuing to fuel the pump in content. Because if you think about people who are now commuting, and all of a sudden they won't be literally behind the wheel, but they'll have that same amount of time to get from uh, home to work, there can be a lot more time for content consumption. So 5G and autonomous driving are one of the uh, interesting uh, combinations that I think you'll see happen uh, in the short run. Michael, it's interesting to talk about that content and the consumption. We've had a lot of new entrants into the streaming wars in 2019 and continue to see so in 2020 with Quibi, Disney, Apple. What have those conversations been like as you see more and more competition in that streaming space? Well, I think um, from our perspective, we look at it through two lenses. Number one, uh, if you're marketing those services, if you're Disney or HBO or Quibi or Peacock or Amazon and Apple, etc., you have to be thinking more like a precision and a performance marketer than a brand marketer because you're now in the business of acquiring subscribers and certainly hoping that the sub subscribers don't churn. So from a marketing perspective, it's a different marketing muscle. From a consumer perspective, it's going to be some binary choices. Uh, we've talked about the skinny bundle from a cable uh, context. I think we're seeing a rebundling uh, that will occur with the streaming services because consumers, according to the research, seem to be in the range of between four and five services that the uh, average consumer uh, will be subscribing to. That's going to create some binary choices because just the ones we ticked off are more than four or five and they're all big players who are going to be spending massive amounts of money on marketing those services, but also creating the content uh, for the consumer to enjoy. So I think it'll be very interesting to see both how that marketing plays out and as well the amount of uh, services that people will be subscribing to uh, in, you know, from a consumer perspective. Michael, in the last year, we've seen a lot of big tech under regulatory scrutiny. Consumers are frustrated over data privacy. Big tech is more and more seen as a problem, not as a solution. 
How do you work with big tech? How do you think big tech plays a role in a broader conversation about contributing good instead of bad? Well, I, I, I was fortunate yesterday to do a keynote here at CES with Mark Benioff, the uh, chairman and co-CEO of Salesforce, and Alan Jope, the CEO of Unilever, two of the most important uh, companies in the world. And we talked just about purpose in marketing and we talked about the role technology can play in delivering on the purpose. And we talked about one example with uh, food waste where Alan Jope talked about an initiative that Unilever was concerned about with food waste. And they reached out to Salesforce in the context of their normal partnership and said, how could we use technology to solve that problem? When you see so much food going to waste and there are food banks uh, within proximity, how do you communicate that information? Salesforce took that on as a project and we're, we're, we're able to make a, a difference. Mark Benioff, of course, talks about um, technology in itself is not good or bad, it's what you do with it. And here again yesterday, our focus at the keynote that MediaLink had was to talk about exactly that, how you can use technology for good. Uh, the other part of it is, the trust factor, and we all understand the importance of trust, and that trust has to transmit not only to marketers and the and the uh, platforms, but the consumers and the platforms. Right, yep, thank you. That was Michael Kasson, founder and chairman and CEO of MediaLink. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, and Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology, and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at Quick Take on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.